Hi, my name is Leo Rakolston II. I am the author of The First Deep Breath, and I am also playing Abdul Malik. Creativity has just been uh, my safe space, but I didn't get into the theater until uh, I was a teenager. And so like, I had a teacher and a mentor take me to, to see a production of For Color Girls. And you know, I'm in my hoodie, you know, I'm a 17-year-old black kid from like North Philly. And you know, like I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go see this play. And I, and I didn't really care too much about it. And so like I, I sat back. Um, by the end of the show, I was I sat up and I was enraptured and I laughed and I cried and I saw my aunts and my mother and my sisters like reflected in these women. And it was the most powerful experience that I've ever had. I marched home and I sat my mom and my dad down and said, Mom, Dad, I've decided what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I'm going to be an artist. And they looked at me and they did the, you know, the thing that any parent does when a 17 year old says, I have decided what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And they, they said, that's great, son. They, you know, they smiled, they nodded, and they were like, okay, maybe it's a phase. But I knew, I knew in the back of that theater um, with those black women igniting something in me um, that has not been extinguished yet. Um, and I don't think it ever will. It wasn't until like after I graduated community college and I told, you know, my dad, I was like, you know, I really want to, I really want to do this. He's like, well, how you going to pay your bills? How you going to eat? And I was like, I don't know, pop, but I got a lot of passion. I don't want to figure it out. And he was like, haha, that's cool. You know, go take your behind down there and take the civil service exam so you can become a corrections officer like me. The power dynamics were just so weird. You know, like for me to be, uh, you know, a 21 year old kid while also being an officer and having to, you know, to run a cell block and, you know, tell these men what to do. These men who, some of whom who made mistakes are also some of the like, you know, the biggest mentors that I had at, a, at the time. I had what I consider to be the privilege um, to meet any man that I will ever play as an actor and any man that I ever write about as a writer. And also like, you know, the guys uh, who were locked up on my unit, some of them, they found out that I was an artist and they just thought that was dope. So they encouraged me to do it. It was like, so what are you doing? I was like, oh, well, you know, I got dreams of applying to like, you know, to Juilliard. It's like, oh, well, you have to do it. And they encouraged me to apply. And every day that I wasn't working uh, toward my dream, they would like hold me accountable. It was like, oh, I see you still here. I see you not pursuing that dream. Eventually I got hurt um, on the job. My hand got, uh, got caught in one of the mechanical doors and you know, broke my, my hand and my wrist. And, um, and I thought, uh, I knew that night that I wasn't coming back. I was like, I think this is it. Um, but, I, but if it wasn't for my time working in corrections, I would have never become a playwright. I, I know that without a shadow of a doubt because I wrote my first play on a cell block, inspired by the men who were surrounding me. And I thought to myself, I was like, well, why don't I produce it? And so I produced and directed this play uh, in a hole in a wall theater in Philly. And it just so happened to catch the attention of one of the artistic directors uh, at uh, one of the local theater companies in Philly, and he just so happened to come down to see it. There was this thing that was happening inside of the, the theater that was really electric, and so he pulled me aside afterwards. He was like, you got a lot of talent, you got a lot of potential, but you need more training. You don't know what you're doing yet, so come work for me. And uh, I followed him. That led to me eventually going to University of the Arts. Took some time off to go work and, you know, do Broadway tours and et cetera. And then eventually uh, one of my best friends, you know, kind of put her foot in my ass and was like, I think you should apply to grad school. Uh, you should, should reapply to Juilliard. I was like, no, 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 no. Uh, I applied to Juilliard at this point, I want to say a total of five times. Uh, I applied three times as an actor and twice as a playwright. Uh, I got in as an actor on my third try. I am the first black man to graduate with a master's degree in drama from Juilliard. I want to say those first three years out of grad school were some of the most difficult years of my life. It was crippling poverty. 
um, it broke me in ways that I didn't even know I could be broken. And it, moved, it still moves me, you know, like now, like to, like to this day, like when I think about that time, you know, eventually met and fell in love with my agent um, and it was just kind of kismet. But then he connected me to another agent, you know, on the lit side for television and film. Um, and they started passing my material along. And then everybody and their mama was like, yo, what's up? Do you want to come write for us? Uh, and I was like, like, like professionally, like for TV? And yeah, and uh, that was how I, you know, landed my first TV writing job on Fargo. Um, and then that turned into another, into another, into another. And that brought me to the West Coast. Um, and so I would bounce back and forth, like, you know, I had one show that was doing, you know, in the West Coast and one show on the East Coast and my play was going up in Chicago. And it was just, you know, it went from three of the most crippling uh, years, you know, of my life to like three of the most abundant years of my life. I was ready to be honest about the things that I didn't want to know. I was ready to be honest about the things that I didn't want to see in myself and in other people. I was ready to start my healing journey, start the conversation on like, what do you need to do in order to heal? Where do I need to go? Where do I need to look? Because a lot of times like people don't really, like nobody gives us direction on that most times. We cannot treat other people as if they're final drafts while expecting people to look at us like we're a rough draft because everybody's a rough draft and we're all writing ourselves in real time. And, we, and all of us, all of our racers are like, you know, chewed up and, you know, we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to make ourselves, you know, and discover ourselves at the same time. And that is an impossible thing to do. But that's the thing that makes us human. And so it's my hope that this piece of art inspires other people to be able to treat themselves like a rough draft and be kind to the other rough drafts that they run into.